Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Leah with Headwater Science Institute, and welcome to Lunch with a Scientist, our Q&A session weekly with a professional scientist designed to show you what a career in the science could look like. And this week, we have with us Dane Simulo talking to us all the way from Virginia. Hi, Dane, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you for being here. So Dane is a science and technology policy fellow at the Department of Defense, and he works on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM education and workforce recruitment and retention. He has a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of California, San Diego, and he earned his PhD at Weill Cornell Medicine in immunology and microbial pathogenesis. So today, He's gonna to talk to us about the history of infectious diseases and vaccines, leading all the way up to how modern vaccines are developed. And I've seen a little bit of his presentation. He's got a lot of fun photos. And so we're really excited to hear what he has to say. So Dane, I will leave it to you. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for this opportunity to speak. So um, I thought vaccines, you know, are at the forefront of people's minds with everything going on with COVID-19 today. Uh, and so that's what I thought I would talk about. So vaccines, where do they come from? How do they work? Uh, and you can see here in the little animated background, uh, actual images and video of your immune cells. Um, granted, they don't glow like that in real life. So today we'll talk about the history of vaccinations. I'll give a little brief um, introduction to your immune system. We'll talk about modern vaccine design. And then the big so what, why does any of this matter? Uh, since I can't see you, um, we can't do like a show of hands, but I want you to think, have you or someone you know had bronchitis? How about the flu? How about chickenpox? And finally, how about polio? My guess is you probably know someone who's had bronchitis or the flu, um, may not know somebody who had chickenpox, uh, and finally, polio, probably don't know anyone who's had polio. So a little bit about the history of the vaccine. The word vaccine comes from the Latin word vaca, meaning cow. Vaca also in Spanish means cow. So how did one of the most powerful tools in preventative medicine arise from cows? So we'll talk a little bit about smallpox dating back to uh, 1157 BCE. So that's way, way back uh, to Edward Jenner in the 1700s all the way up through the World Health Organization's efforts in 1980. So smallpox was a horrible disease that would cause fever, vomiting, and painful whole body blistery rashes, which I would not recommend Googling. I would just, I don't know, look up puppies or ducklings and kittens instead. So on average, about one out of three adults who got sick from smallpox died and children died at even higher rates. So that's a 33% mortality rate. And you can compare this to the flu, which in the US is about 0.1% mortality. So about one in every 1,000 may die from the flu. Mummies from ancient Egypt have been found with potential smallpox scars. So it had been infecting humans for potentially thousands of years. Throughout history, major smallpox ep epidemics have erupted in Europe, Asia and Africa with an estimated 300 to 500 million people dying. And as you maybe learned from history class, when uh, colonists and conquistadores reached the Americas, uh, they brought it to the Native Americans who were nearly wiped out by it. And here uh, you can see uh, the uh, illustration on the top left of Aztec six with smallpox from 491 years ago. And on the right, you can see an illustration from 130 years ago in Japan of a samurai warding off a smallpox demon. So here's the smallpox demon, and he's got a little guy riding on the back with smallpox. Um, and on the bottom left is a map from just 88 years ago, so around your grandparents or great-grandparents' age, uh, showing where smallpox infections were reported. You can see in the non-grade countries just how many nations were affected all over the world. So clearly smallpox was a big medical problem and people were desperate for a way to treat it or prevent it. Now, variolation or inoculation uh, was practiced early on in China, India, and parts of Africa. Uh, in China, people with mild cases of smallpox would have their scabs removed, 
ground up and blown up uninfected people's noses. Delicious. And in Sudan, pus was taken from a blister and rubbed into a scratch on an uninfected person's arm or leg. So people who received variolation either never got smallpox or died less frequently, but they did risk infecting other people. Um, Europeans caught on to this as they traveled. Uh, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, which is an awesome name and a tongue twister, uh, was the first person to really push for its practice in Europe. And variolation was great and all, uh, but people still got sick and could infect people around them, and they still sometimes died from variolation. At about in the 1700s, uh, European doctors noticed that getting cowpox would make you immune to smallpox. Uh, it was observed that milkmaids would get cowpox from milking cows, which was a much milder uh, disease than smallpox. So it turns out eight maids of milk and was probably a better gift than a partridge in a pear tree. Uh, Edward Jenner was a British doctor born in the 1700s. And he got the idea that milkmaids touching blisters on cows' udders with small, uh, cowpox was how they contracted cowpox. Uh, and in case you were wondering, Jenner, hmm, I looked it up, and the Jenners of Kardashian fame are not direct descendants of Edward Jenner, at least as far as I can tell. So anyway, he thought that the inoculation with cowpox might be safer than variolation with smallpox and could make you immune to smallpox. So he tested it out on a kid by giving him cowpox from a milkmaid first, then waiting and infecting him with the actual smallpox. So ethically, we would never do this today. When you get a vaccine, you just get the vaccine and you don't get infected with the real thing by a doctor. Um, luckily, the kid did not get smallpox and Jenner was able to write a scientific report where he called this method a vaccine after the cows that gave uh, cowpox. So in this diagram, you can see that he took the uh, cowpox from the milkmaid and gave it to the child. Uh, and then the child uh, was infected and got sick with cowpox. It was pretty mild. But then he would take the scabs from someone infected with actual smallpox and then give them to the kid. And later the kid would never get the smallpox. So that demonstrated uh, that the cowpox was protecting the kid from the smallpox. Uh, Jenner went on to repeat this successfully with 23 other people, which is something important in science, being able to reproduce this result. Other doctors, and even a farmer, had actually done similar work, but Jenner's uh, published work made it pretty widespread, and so he gets all the credit, <laughs> which is sometimes, unfortunately, a reality in science. Uh, keep in mind, though, that even though germ theory had been proposed by physicians a few years before, well, no, much earlier before, uh, it didn't actually catch on until 27 years after Jenner's death. People in Europe and Asia believed that bad air or miasma was from rotting flesh and that caused disease. So Jenner likely had no idea what was causing the disease. Today, we know that smallpox is caused by a virus and cowpox is genetically related to the smallpox virus. In 1885, uh, the second vaccine was created by Louis Pasteur against rabies, and you might recognize his name from pasteurization of milk. Uh, he infected animals to quote unquote weaken the virus, and when nine-year-old Joseph Meister was brought to him after being bitten by a rabid animal, uh, Pasteur was reluctant, but ultimately said YOLO and yeeted the vaccine at him, and it saved Joseph's life. Uh, and what I mean when I say live attenuated here on the, on the slide is that uh, the virus is weakened and can't make people sick. This is like if Jenner gave a weakened version of smallpox uh, as a vaccine instead of cowpox. And here is Pasteur on the cover of Vanity Fair, which can you imagine if he were on the cover of a magazine today? It doesn't quite register. He's not exactly like a supermodel. Um, but you don't have to imagine because I did it for you. So there he is. Now, in 1959, so this is like a century or more later, uh, the World Health Organization launched its first campaign to eradicate smallpox using vaccines. Unfortunately, it failed mostly for logistical reasons. But in 1967, the World Health Organization tried again. And finally, on May 8, 1980, the World Health Organization declared smallpox to be eradicated from the entire world. And so here you can see on this graph, the number of reported cases of smallpox around in the world starting around 1920. Uh, and then in the 1960s, when the World Health Organization uh, began its campaign, you see a steady decline until 1980, where there are no more cases all the way until today. So now we're gonna talk a little bit and switch gears about the immune system 
Uh, so how does your body fight infections and how do vaccines actually protect you? So infections can come in several different flavors, viral, bacterial, uh, parasitic, like protozoans, worms, bugs, and finally, fungal. No, not like the zombies from the games and movies, more like the foot kind. And please note that I have once again generously spared your eyes from an infected foot. This one is a healthy foot. So your immune system is incredibly complex, but it can be split into two branches, the innate and the adaptive immune system. To give you an idea of their function, imagine you cl close your eyes and I hand you a spherical object. Using only your sense of touch, you can probably tell that it's a fruit, and but it's not a banana or an apple or a carrot or a baseball bat. Uh, that's like your innate immune system. It can generally sense the categories of infections, the categories that I mentioned in the previous slide. Now, say you open your eyes and I allow you to cut it open and taste it and smell it. Now you can tell it's a grapefruit because of its color, the slightly bitter and sour flavor. That's like your adaptive immune system. It can specifically identify the exact bacteria or virus causing an infection. This means that your adaptive immune system is much better at targeting things it recognizes as not you. Uh, and it can tailor its response to use the best tools to get rid of that infection. So your innate immune system is fast. And you can see on this graph how fast it kicks in. So right here on the order of minutes to hours. But your adaptive immune system here, this curve, is much slower and it can take days to weeks to form a response. Um, and you can see the second curve doesn't start rising until much later after you've been infected. So during that time, if the bacteria or virus overwhelms your innate immune system, you can get really sick or maybe even die. But if the adaptive immune system kicks in, you'll be able to recover. Now, the special thing about your adaptive immune response isn't just its specificity, that's pretty special, but it also has what we call memory. So that means when you get infected a second time by the same bug, your adaptive immune response is faster and stronger than the first time. See how steep and squished this curve here is after the secondary exposure, as opposed to the first one, see how long and and elongated that one is. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, some infections can work faster than your immune system and make you really sick before you get a second chance to mount an, an adaptive immune response. Uh, and some viruses like herpes virus, chicken pox, uh, mono, warts, or HIV can hide in your body forever, potentially. Um, vaccines act like the infections without making you sick or as sick so that when you do encounter the real infection, your body can respond quickly before you get sick and it can even stop those forever viruses from taking root. So now we're gonna kind of touch on uh, the modern vaccine design and how vaccines are made today. So the old way, um, after Edward Jenner's discovery, cows were infected and their skin lesions were ground up, freeze dried and used as vaccine material, or they were transferred between people who had the cowpox uh, inoculation all the way up through the 1900s. Uh, Louis Pasteur's method, however, took the diseased tissue from a sick patient, this kid here, and then infected an animal. And then they took that infected animal tissue and then infected another animal and another animal and another animal and so on until the bug was no longer able to cause severe disease in humans. So that's why it's called a live attenuated or a weakened virus. But Jenner and Pasteur could never have a, even dreamed of the tools we have at our disposal today. Uh, we know a lot more about how our immune system works and we can study a virus or bacterium and immune response much faster than before. We can isolate individual genes or introduce the exact mutations we want rather than waiting for mutations to happen by sequentially infecting animals. And this video here uh, was taken by, or was created by a group in New Zealand. And you can see this is the actual structure of a virus on a molecular level. So that is the kind of resolution we have today. We can tell exactly every little atom on a virus and where it falls in place. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> So uh, I told you about um, you know, the modern techniques we have. So how, what are the actual steps to developing a vaccine? So first, you need to identify the cause. Despite our amazing new technologies, this isn't always easy. If the bug is something we've never seen before, we wouldn't know actually what to test for exactly. 
So once you've isolated the bug, you can produce it for further screening and testing experiments. Um, and things like COVID-19, we knew, we recognized from earlier infections that were similar, like uh, SARS and MERS. So the next thing you need to do is collect blood samples from people who got better and see which cells are the ones that attack the bug specifically and actually prevent it from causing infection or are able to clear infection. Now you have the bug and the cells that attack the bug, you need to locate the bug's molecular ID card. So this is a little ID card for immune recognition. Your immune system might actually attack different molecules and places on the bug, but maybe one or two actually stop the infection. Uh, and this is like the part where you had to kind of identify the grapefruit, right? So this, how you recognize the grapefruit and tell it apart from other, um, other fruits and vegetables. The same thing can be done with uh, the viruses or bacteria. Next, you need to create components that will actually go into the vaccine. So some vaccines you kill a virus or a bacterium, so it's just bits and pieces. Uh, some you mutate like Pasteur did, uh, but instead of getting mutant superpowers like the X-Men, the viruses become weak and they don't make you as sick. Uh, some vaccines use entirely different viruses to create a single molecule ID card um, for like a specific target for your immune system without putting in the original virus or bacteria. Now, before you can test the vaccines in people, you need to test them in animals to see whether they're safe and whether they're effective. And you can do experiments on the animals that you cannot or should not do in people. Um, now, this is the hardest step for a lot of vaccines and therapies. You have to get healthy people to volunteer to be tested. We start with a small group of people, um, healthy adults, um, and then we gradually test more people like the elderly or children. And we do this because there were actually some vaccines in the early 1900s that weren't tested and manufactured correctly, and people did wind up getting sick and dying from them. So using clinical trials and all of the safety regulations we have in place today, doctors can closely monitor people who get the vaccine before it goes out to the larger population where they can't control it. And, monitor those people as closely. So now, assuming you're successful, now you can finally start producing the vaccine. Scientists use things like chicken eggs or bug egg cells to create large quantities of virus or proteins, or they can use special media, in quotes, filled with nutrients for bacteria to, for those to grow. Um, and because we rely on living cells to act like little mini factories, uh, we're still restricted on how fast and how much we can produce. Finally, you made it to the last step. Congratulations, but now you have to actually get it out to everyone in the world who needs it. And just think about how many billions of people there are in the world and how far apart they all are. It's incredibly expensive to make the vaccine, put it into syringes or pills, keep it from expiring while it's in transit, and have trained people administer it to everyone. This process takes a long time, on the order of several years, so you can imagine just how hard everyone is working right now to try to get a vaccine for COVID-19 as fast as possible. So I told you about the steps now, but what actually goes into the vaccine? So you have to put the actual bug or molecule ID card in, otherwise there won't be any immune response to the appropriate um, infectious agent. You need to put in preservatives and stabilizers to prevent the bug from breaking down or the vaccine from being contaminated by like a different bacterium. Obviously not literally fruit preservatives. Don't go telling people you're shooting, you know, <laughs> doctors are putting a jam into your arm. Um, and then finally, adjuvants. So adjuvants are basically molecules that stimulate the immune system. Uh, without the proper stimulus, it's like this cat being poked. You don't get the kind of response that you would expect. Uh, you can think of it also this way. Without an adjuvant, the vaccine is like Tony Stark. He's great in his own right, right? Yeah, woo, Tony Stark. But with the adjuvant, the vaccine becomes Iron Man, and now he can do some amazing work. And if any of those things make you pause and say, whoa, 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 we're injecting what now? Just remember that these things are at minuscule doses that have been tested through clinical trials. And even now, data is being collected to monitor any adverse events associated with the vaccinations. All of these steps are in place to ensure safety for the general public and all the evidence points to vaccines being safe. Finally, the most important ingredient for creating an effective vaccine is people. 
people. You need teams of scientists and physicians who specialize in all of those steps I mentioned before. And vaccine research takes teams of labs from all over the world. Technology is not advanced enough to replace grad students and researchers with robots yet. So until that day, we need hardworking scientists with creative and innovative minds to tackle these problems and put in the work. So finally, so what? Who cares? So three advances in modern medicine have saved countless lives in modern society. That's hygiene, vaccines, and antibiotics. But increasingly, we're seeing a rise in bacterial infections that are antibiotic resistant, um, the antibiotics being able to kill the bacteria. People used to die from simple cuts in scrapes or ammonia, or, sorry, pneumonia, um, but antibiotics severely reduced all that. And as you can see from the picture above, the white dots, the little disks here, have antibiotics in them, and they can stop these yellow bacteria from growing close to them. But in the right plate, you have bacteria that have antibiotic resistance. And you can see now the bacteria are able to glow, grow close to the little disks with antibiotics on them. Uh, so if you are able to be vaccinated against bacterial infections, you won't have to rely so heavily on antibiotics. Of course, there are also outbreaks like COVID-19, SARS, H1N1 flu, Ebola, and Zika. They've all wrecked havoc on society in the last decade alone. So without proper vaccines available, they threaten our way of life. But just having the vaccine isn't enough. People have to actually take it. And not just the people who need it most, which leads us to <clears throat> herd immunity. So to explain what herd immunity is, here you can see a situation without vaccines where the blue people are uninfected people and the red people here are sick people. Uh, without a vaccine, this virus spreads to all the blue people, turning them red here. Now, next you see when a vaccine is available. So the yellow people are vaccinated here. And what you see is um, they don't turn red and become sick, while most of the blue people do turn red and become sick. So finally, you have herd immunity. And herd immunity, you've got enough people who are vaccinated in yellow, and even the few blue people here um, who weren't vaccinated don't become sick. They're mostly protected from the red sick people. So who are the few blue people in this case? There are people who are allergic to certain ingredients in vaccines, or people who are immunocompromised, people whose immune systems don't work correctly, like people with certain cancers or autoimmune disorders. Uh, and they may not get that adaptive immune memory, even if they did get the vaccine. So you've probably heard of or know someone who is anti-vax, or maybe you yourself are against or skeptical of vaccinations. The anti-vaxxer movement is nothing new. Here, Edward Jenner is administering smallpox vaccines, and you can see people are sprouting little cows uh, from their arms and legs. Uh, and this image was taken from the early 1800s, not that long after Edward Jenner introduced vaccination. And it's not surprising. People did not understand how it worked, not even the doctors and scientists at the time, really. So people were naturally afraid. Um, nonetheless, because of vaccination, smallpox has been completely eradicated from the world. And today we have all the knowledge about modern medicine in the world at our fingertips. But there are also people who still use their platforms to spread misinformation. And some of those people may even have scientific or clinical credentials. So it can be really difficult to tell who to trust. But hopefully today I've shown you a clear example of the power of vaccines to prevent death and disease. And you understand how far we've come with science and technology to ensure the safety and effectiveness of vaccines. It's okay to be wary of things you're not familiar with. Scientists, clinicians, and pharmaceutical companies should be held accountable for, by the public to make sure they're doing everything by the book and not cutting corners. But when you're presented with overwhelming and convincing evidence of vaccine safety and their importance, at some point you have to be willing to reject your fears. Otherwise you run the risk of being a conspiracy theorist rather than just skeptical. So this picture here was taken of an iron lung ward around the 1950s. These people were all infected with a disease called polio, which would paralyze people, it would disfigure them and it would stop them from breathing, making them dependent on iron lungs like these and then later on respirators, the same kinds of respirators that people are using right now. And here you can see the results of the World Health Organization's efforts in eradicating polio. 
So on top here in 1988, the countries in red are the only ones where are, are the ones where polio was common, and you can see that it was pretty widespread. Um, but then in 2017, there's only maybe a few countries that have polio that are hanging out. Um, but unlike smallpox, polio has not been completely eliminated from the world, meaning it could make a comeback. Whooping cough. So whooping cough is another disease, um, and it causes pneumonia, seizures, brain damage, and death, especially in babies. Uh, this graph shows cases of whooping cough cases in the U.S. declining after the introduction of the DTP vaccine in the 1950s. Uh, and we dropped from hundreds of thousands of cases every year to less than 10,000 in the early 2000s. But with the anti-vax movement, we've begun to see a rise in cases again. And the same is true with another disease called measles. So choosing not to vaccinate doesn't just affect the individual who makes that choice. It also threatens to bring back diseases that were eliminated in our country, as well as the lives of people with weakened immune systems or who are allergic to vaccines who have no choice. Sadly, one of the pitfalls of the success of vaccines is that people collectively forget just how devastating infectious diseases can be and how easily they're preventable. So what can you do? I have only scratched the surface with this talk. There is so much to learn and so much we in the scientific community have yet to learn about these topics. And a 25 minute talk can't possibly do it justice. So learn about vaccines, disease, and immunity. Talk with your doctor about getting vaccinated. There are circumstances where it's not recommended that you get vaccinated, so you should consult a board-certified medical professional. Practice good hygiene. Wash your hands correctly and don't touch your face, especially after touching other surfaces. Share. I can only talk with so many uncles and aunts and old high school friends who became naturopaths over Facebook. We need everyone who understands the importance and effectiveness of vaccines to have dialogues with people who don't understand and are possibly putting themselves, their children, or others at risk by not, not, by not vaccinating. And then finally, learn together. If those people you talk to ask questions that you don't know the answer to, do the research together. Find ways to identify reliable uh, versus questionable resources. Learn how to spot false claims, um, bad or misinterpreted data, and be open to being wrong. Have a little humility and listen to what their concerns are. So with that, I just want to thank you for your attention. And I'll leave you with this quote from Ben Franklin. Uh, An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So while a cure for disease is fantastic, not getting sick in the first place is better. And here are all the sources that I used for this talk today. They're freely available to you. And there's some additional resources down here in case you want to learn more about the immune system. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dane. That was fascinating. Um, so I think it was aptly timed since we are sort of in what some are calling the age of coronavirus to hear about how these vaccines are being developed. And I just wanna kick us off um, with what might be a burning question in a lot of people's minds. I know that you're not necessarily an expert, but could you give some insight to where we might be with the coronavirus? vaccine or or just what that process might look like? Well, um, as I mentioned, uh, the vaccine development process takes a long time and those clinical trials take a long time to make sure that the vaccines are safe. And there are currently multiple efforts going around the world right now. And there are some that have shown promise, but it's still going to take time. Um, but the fact that multiple people are working on that and there have been some um, government agencies like the FDA that have uh, allowed some fast tracking so that they can kind of consolidate um, some of the clinical trials into a, um, into a sm shorter period of time. Uh, but then again, there's also the, the, um, the issue of manufacturing and distributing. So even once we actually get a vaccine that's like, oh, it works, it's great, um, you know, we still have to produce it and we have to deliver it to everybody in the world. And that is a huge undertaking. But I know I'll be like signing up as soon as one's available to me. <laughs> yes, it's, it's certainly a fascinating model, what's going on in today um, for medical professionals. It's a very interesting time. So we're going to go to some audience questions here. Um, sure. I have a question from Jack Holmes, who's one of our board members. Hi, Jack. Thanks for watching. Uh, he wants to know, going back to the beginning of your talk, can you go into more into what the adjuvants are? 
Sure. So when I talked about um, kind of beefing up the vaccine and uh, eliciting a stimulus, um, or, you know, uh, stimulating the immune system, what I'm talking about is uh, that the fact that bacteria and viruses have certain sort of unique characteristics that make your body kind of have inflammation and, and respond in a, like a, oh, this is a danger, danger signal. So it, when you kind of mash up the bacteria or you get rid of uh, certain components and only have that little molecular ID card, um, it may not elicit a response. The immune system might be like, hey, this is no problem. Um, and you can kind of think of it like, you know, when you have allergies, your body is responding to something like peanuts, right? There's no problem with peanuts, um, but it, it responds incorrectly. So we want to add these adjuvants and put them into the vaccine so that when they go into your immune system, your immune system range registers this as like, oh, this is something we need to actually form a response to and then figure out. Otherwise, they'll just ignore it. Mm. That's fascinating. And, and that kind of connects back to a previous scientist talk that we had um, talking about the implications of vaccines that have side effects or, or don't work. So it's mm -hmm. fascinating to hear how you target the vaccine to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So I have another question from Lara here. Lara is one of the high school students in our summer research program doing awesome research on bluebirds. And she would like to know why are viruses not considered living? Sure. And I just want to like make a small comment. Bird, that's an awesome last name. Very fitting for you doing bluebird research. Um, but why are viruses not considered living? So I showed you that little video of the little virus and its structure. Um, and this is actually kind of like a strange philosophical question because what is really living, right? Does it mean it has a metabolism? Does it mean it replicates? You know, how you define what is alive is kind of a philosophical and murky question. Um, but why we generally, you know, in general talk, uh, think of viruses as not alive is because they are not cellular. They just have the, their genes, which allow them to replicate. And they have like usually a protein capsid and maybe like a lipid envelope around them. Um, once they're inside of a cell, you could kind of make the argument that they're alive, right? Because if they're infecting your cell and they are kind of taking over everything, hijacking your cell, does that cell become the virus in a way? Um, so yes, viruses are not, you know, considered alive in the, in this typical sense, but it is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And Laura has another question, uh, related to our little coronavirus discussion. And in your opinion, do you, or do scientists think that it's caused by animals or is it from a lab? So there's a little bit of uh, murkiness about, you know, understanding where it came from exactly. Um, some people think that it might have been an accidental leak from a lab, um, but the definite source from uh, for SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, um, it was zoonotic. So zoonotic means that it left from animals to humans. Uh, and there are a lot of different viruses that do that, like the flu virus. So that's why you hear about like bird flu or swine flu. Um, it's when you, you know, have all of these animals that are in close proximity with people uh, and you know you, they can pass viruses between them and make you sick. So that is ultimately where COVID-19 came from. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay, um, so we've got a question from Spencer Usedin, our program director here. Why do some vaccines for diseases give us immunity longer than vaccines for other diseases? So that is a very good question. And that's not necessarily known for each vaccine or disease. Um, so for instance, with COVID-19, there's been some recent evidence that shows that people's immunity actually just doesn't last that long uh, for the virus. So people who got sick and recovered, they were tested for antibodies and they find that they're not you know, producing as many antibodies. And we don't necessarily understand why, um, but it really just kind of depends on how your immune system responds. And it could also be different from person to person, right? Some people might have the same vaccine and have really long lasting immunity while others don't. So it's a combination of probably some really complex factors that we don't quite understand yet. Um, but what we do know is that those memory cells, the cells that remember what it was can last a really long time. And so that's why you do see that when you do have certain vaccines, um, you don't have to get boosters like with tetanus. Mm. Interesting. That's fascinating. And so I'm wondering about the research that you do. 
it's so much on the front end where you're working with people and working with things that impact people. Yeah. Um, if we have a young person watching who may want to do the same kind of science, can you talk a little bit about your journey to get here and what recommendations you might have for someone who wants to enter this field? Yeah, sure. So uh, I got into science because I just, I saw so many people in my own life who were suffering from diseases like autoimmune disorders or infectious diseases at kind of rates of disparity, meaning like some would have, like women might have it more than men or, you know, this community might have it more than that community. Um, so I became really interested in biomedical sciences and that's what I decided to major in in college. Um, and then I decided to apply to grad school. And I have to say, you know, just a full disclosure that science isn't an easy path. Um, it's, it's very difficult, um, especially if you kind of don't fit the mold. I'm kind of like a silly person, if you couldn't tell. Uh, I don't, I make jokes and say YOLO and yeet, uh, like who does that? Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's not an easy path, um, but it is very rewarding. And the kind of access to the amazing work and, and the amazing people that you'll meet, um, it's, it's something that I wouldn't give up. Um, and now I've switched to working on sort of like the policy side. Um, and I'm really interested as, you know, uh, Leah mentioned at the beginning, I'm interested in working with people and helping improve that STEM experience so that when you younger generation go through the scientific pipeline, it's a little bit better for you. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And where is your research and your work going now? What do you see in the future? So um, I'm not at the bench anymore. So I'm not doing lab work and I'm not, uh, you know, doing, creating um, you know, necessarily any vaccines myself, but I am working to support those people who are doing those things. And science policy is it's a way to use my analytical skills that I picked up in graduate school and apply them to problems that the government has. Um, mm -hmm. So in this case, it's looking at STEM education, but there are other scientists who are using it right now for the COVID-19 effort. Um, and they're using that to kind of help us, you know, that policy of fast tracking the clinical trials that probably was influenced by scientists who are working for the government. It's fascinating. It's a very interesting time to be in science with what's going on in our modern world. Yeah, there's always this weird kind of dichotomy of like, oh, wow, this is so cool and interesting, but also like, oh, this is terrible. Like, whoa. <laughs> right. Well, I think those are all of our audience questions for today. Um, I think we're going to wrap up here. Dane, Similo, thank you so much for volunteering to talk to our youth and for sharing all of your awesome research. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks Have a good day. Me. All right. Thanks. Bye.